We are living in, in very exciting times. We have uh, seen now for the first time gravitational waves from uh, binary black holes. And um, people say that really have opened a new window into our universe. And you have been at the absolute forefront of this field here for many, many years. Um, how do you see this uh, window to be opened? Thank you. Well, it is indeed, I would say, a very exciting time. I'm happy to live in this very particular time because um, in just a few years, I would say less than a decade, we have been able to observe the first binary black hole, as you say, orbiting around each other, emitting gravitational waves, both of which were predicted by Einstein theory of general relativity. We have even been able to uh, see uh, really visually uh, a black hole from the black hole that we have at the center of our own galaxy, the closest, one of the closest galaxies or most visible galaxy, I would say, uh, astronomically a uh, big galaxy like M87. We have um, also some indication from recent um, observations uh, from the pulsar timing arrays that there might be a huge hum, a background out there in the universe of binary supermassive black holes. So it's really a, a very special time with a lot of discoveries and a lot of upcoming discoveries. So that has been, you know, taking many, many years of establishing the observations that are actually working now. But part of it is also to uh, simulate, you know, the orbit of the black holes, right? So if we really, you know, going to break this problem down, first you start with two black holes, how they formed is, you know, an astrophysical problem. But once they are formed, you have them in their orbit. They orbit each other, they're getting closer and closer to each other, and they're getting closer by the emission of these gravitational waves, which are really perturbations in space-time, right? Yes. And as they're getting closer and closer and closer, at some point, they form a new black hole. Mm -hmm. And that whole process really has been, you know, a mystery. How does these waves look like for, for many, many years? Like, what are we looking for once we have the observation running, right? And, and you did some of the first simulations of Einstein's equations and predicted how these waves look like. So, so can you tell something about uh, that pioneering study? Yeah, that, that's correct. Um, so um, I've always been interested about binary black holes. So, um, you know, even if during my PhD, I worked more on different aspects of black holes. I, I started working uh, during my postdoctoral research here, uh, as a postdoctoral in binary black holes. And, um, you know, this is a highly nonlinear phenomenon predicted by the Einstein theory of general relativity that when these black holes in spiral, but especially merge together, they emit such a very powerful burst of radiations. And because the Einstein's equations are the only way to predict what happens during the merger and during also what happens afterwards, um, we have to solve the Einstein's equation, the full nonlinear system. Now, the Einstein's equations are very beautiful and compact, written in the language uh, of tensors, but um, when you um, want to find specific solutions, it has been very, very hard to, especially solutions that involve binary black holes, because it's, um, it's, it's a complicated solution that has not only the black holes, the horizons that defines the black holes, but also gravitational waves that they need. So it's a very difficult problem to solve. Um, to find a solution such in the Einstein's equation. And you only can do it um, by integrating the Einstein's equation numerically. So um, I started working on this um, as a postdoc. Um, and, um, you know, this topic grew on me. I learned more and more on um, how to do the numerical um, codes associated with, um, you know, solving these equations. And, um, Sort of almost magically around 2005, um, the first person who actually did solve the problem was Franz Vittorius. Uh, but, um, you know, he did solve it uh, using a completely different method. And by that time, um, um, uh, my group and, and, and me, uh, we were uh, looking at solving the problem using a framework that um, uh, most of the people were using. Um, 
because you know there were decades that um, people spent decades in in writing these very complex codes and and so you, it costed a lot of human resources and a lot of resources to get there and so I wanted to see if there was a way to solve the problem using um, the current So codes. what was the problem actually? So the problem so was... People sometimes, <laughs> you know, talk about that code explodes, you know, yes. previously. Like, yes. uh, how is that? So, uh, how can I understand that? Uh, so problem? the problem in general was due to the fact that the black holes, you know, first of all, computers don't like black holes. Black holes are singularities, mm -hmm. you know, they have horizons and all of that. Computers are... But you, you don't know, have, have to time. simulate the things inside the black holes. So no, in, no, we, okay. we, we have a way to... In, in the method that I, um, I proposed in 2005, we have a way to compactify uh, the space uh, inside the black hole horizon into, so say, one point. It's called puncture. And that idea is an idea that simplifies the equations. And at that time, though, um, when I started working, and it was already, that, that method was already proposed earlier on by other. Uh, people um, like, for example, Bernd Brookman in Germany, um, how to use it for proposing initial data for starting binary black hole coalescence, but nobody was able to use it for doing uh, long-term stable evolutions of the Einstein's equation. So, um, so the it. So we talked a little bit about it and what people were doing really, which was a little bit wrong because they were asking these black holes, um, this puncture actually, how they were treated, to actually be fixed on the grid. So they were not moving. So the idea was then you evolve the space time around and you fix the black holes on the grid and you know everything should work. And so you don't have to worry about this puncture moving across the grid. But that was making the Einstein's equation screen because um, then all the dynamics that was supposed to go in actually the motion of the black holes orbiting around each other was going into the metric, the space-time itself. That was going really wild. And you know, the Einstein's equation are nonlinear and you have very, very steep gradients, you know. So the, the, yeah, yeah, so you, you excite any stabilities. So we realized that, and um, so we a little bit realized that um, when uh, you know um, I was looking at what actually people were doing for binary neutron stars, and so let's say what would happen if we actually remove this condition first that the black holes you know are fixed on, on the grid, and then you know suddenly we saw the code didn't crash anymore, but you know. I must say we had to go a little bit beyond that because then how do you move it, right? So you had to devise the proper gauge or coordinate conditions mm -hmm. to um, move it across the grid. And that took us a little bit of time because, you know, it's not entirely obvious, you know, how to do that. But once we were able to figure it, figure out this, um, you know, uh, figure out what gauge condition, this is why it's called the moving puncture gauge. Mm -hmm. Um, then, you know, everything worked like magically. It was like, um, I don't know, wow, what happens, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, so it was, it was a very, a very interesting um, time of my, of my life. So what was the, f you know, first few problems that you was looking forward to simulate and, and, and try to understand? Or maybe you hope to see something new happen, right? Like, where was the excitement at that point? The, the excitement was to discover what happens yeah, yeah. when black hole collide. And, you know, nobody was able to do this problem oh. before. And so um, as soon as, you know, I, we realized we could do this problem, first of all, yeah. we published our paper. And then everybody, you know, was excited because at that time, um, you know, you know, everybody had implemented very similar code because remember the method that I, we presented was basically based on a method that most of the group had implemented. Yeah. So that changed the landscape of mm -hmm. numerical relativity, which mm -hmm. is numerical general relativity solving the Einstein's equation numerically for, for binary black holes. And so, um, so first I was then in, uh, competition with the rest of the world yeah. and uh, <laughs> so but it was an exciting time because yeah. obviously we were we were 
the first are running there and we just uh, did a few simulations. Um, you know, you know, the first thing we looked at is what happens if the black holes are spinning. Yeah. You know, we wanted to see if you know they're spinning very fast. And they're spinning with the um, spins uh, aligned with the orbital momentum, or or you know against. So if we and think of like the black holes, right? Not only have a mass, but they can also have spins, you know great spin rotating, right? Yeah. Yes, and that spin could have been. You know, created either when the black hole formed, or even when you merge two black holes, yes. right? The, the the resulting black hole tend to have some spin. So, spins, so yes. spinning black holes are really something that we believe are out there. You know, yes, everything rotates. You know, yeah, exactly. all planets, all stars yeah, yeah, yeah. rotate, yeah. and black hole can really yeah. rotate very fast. So, what did you find in, in so, some so of these? So, so here is it: when yeah. black holes rotate and they rotate very fast, especially if they rotate, you know, in a way that is not symmetrical. Yeah. So. They emit gravitational radiation when they emerge in a very asymmetrical way. So it's it's like the, there's more being in one direction. Can I think about it like a recoil? Yes, when you're that's like exactly. Shooting something, you get that's like a exactly. push in the That's exactly design. that. Yeah. And so we discovered that black hole, the, the final merger of a black hole, can get this huge gravitational wave recoil. So um, you know, can be getting um, to move at speeds of thousands of kilometers per second. So here we are and talking about the final black hole that has the been final, formed, the, final black the, the hole merger, emerged, and then yeah. you simply get a kick after. It yes, has, that uh, is correct. Yes. Even the center of mass seems to be you know, stationary before it's merging. Once it's merging, you get the recoil, and yes. then the black hole simply shoots out. With, it shoots out. With of there, kil thousands of kilometers. Yeah, yeah. thousands, and that is my seems, you know, a tiny fraction of the speed of light, but if you think about the escape velocity of the larger galaxies, like elliptic galaxy, that's comparable. And so that had a lot of implications. That's for a problem for if you want to say form massive black holes. Like the 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 fact is that you see these very massive black holes, right? Yes. But how do you form them, right? And 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 one way could be well, you're just going to merge a lot of smaller black yes. holes. But now you're saying if they are spinning. And the spins are not, you know, correlated. They are, you know, sitting with some relative anchors. Then you won't be able to grow them. You just kick them out of the kick galaxy, and you're basically yeah. lost. Yeah. yeah, but of course you have to have very special uh, arrangements of these spins for mm. getting into this situation. And uh, then, you know, there were astronomers who were looking at potential observation. But of course, you know, it's very hard to to see them unless they retain some gas with it. Okay, yeah. So if they retain, because you know, uh, black holes at the centers of galaxies, uh, they are in a very gas-rich environment. So if the black holes get ejected, it can retain uh, an accretion disk. And that uh, is, would be sufficiently, could be sufficiently oh, So you can actually see these yes. kicked black holes by the emission of light from the crystal. That disks. is correct. Wow. And that's something that really excites me these days. Yeah. So if we, if we think, you know, as astrophysicists that are sitting and looking at this problem very far away, and with the observations that we have right now of the gravitational waves, then what can you learn from these gravitational waves? Like, the, what properties of the system are you, are you inferring from the waves? Yes, so uh, so there are two types of signals that uh, at least supermassive black holes can can emit gravitational waves, as we're mentioning, yeah. are um, a, a property of the space time uh, surrounding the black holes. And what we can learn is is essentially the characteristics of the objects themselves, mm -hmm. um, how massive they are, what kind of you know mass uh, differences they have how fast they are rotating. And maybe even if they're black holes or not. That or is correct. We, we, can, we can discern if they are black holes or maybe they're a neutron star, depending on how massy they are. Um, we can see the characteristic of the orbits. Are they orbiting in a quasi-circular way or are they, the orbit are highly eccentric, for mm. example. <clears throat> we can see a lot of the characteristic and that tells us a lot about the environment where these black holes are, are sitting. Um, and so, and then another way to also mm. that black holes, as we said, is light. But that required that the black holes have gas surrounding gas. Oh, and yeah. that's okay, more yeah. probable yeah. for supermassive yeah. black holes. So most of the massive. black holes that we have seen so far with the LIGO has been like on the lighter mass. And you can see yes. like, you know, 
a few solar masses up to about 100 solar masses yeah. in different combinations. Yeah. Um, but if you look towards you know, our own galaxy, as you also pointed out, you, you have a massive black hole there and you have looked at that by looking at uh, you know, stars orbiting over many, many years. And you're saying also that there could be like these supermassive black holes orbiting each other in other galaxies. Yes. Um, like what are the different probes that, that we can uh, hope to, to see that population yes. within the, in the future? Well, you know, um, <coughs> we see galaxies merging mm. and um, that is um, now been seen in many of the observations and uh, we know that most of the active uh, galaxies that have a very um, active galactic nucleus with a lot of gas and stars in the centers do host black holes in their centers and these black holes might have millions to solar mass millions to billions solar masses so they're, they're really huge monsters and so if galaxies uh, merge um, astronomers today expect to see also black hole their black hole merge as a consequence and um, so uh, we have uh, some candidates out there, but you know, it's really, really hard to see what is at the core of the galaxy mm. once they get very close. So in order to do so, to detect uh, really what kind of light they would emit, what kind of emission they would get, uh, one has to model that, one has to simulate that. And uh, I heard about some new observations from the pulsar timing areas, right, where that has indicated that is by mapping or using pulsars rotating Newton stars in our galaxy, using that as clocks, right, yes. and you have measured some humming or some background of massive black holes. Um, and those black holes, I know that you're also trying to simulate with the whole structure of gas and, and, and all the, all the yes. electromagnetic parts that you might see from, the, from that. So the combination of gravitational waves and, and, and electromagnetic signatures, how do you see the future of those two things coming together? In the, yes. You know, we can also go in the further future with these LISA uh, instruments that's launched into space. Uh. Yes. So uh, I think this is very exciting because gravitational waves, LISA, as you mentioned, is a space mission in mm -hmm. the future, hopefully 10 years from now and we'll go out and detect gravitational waves from merging supermassive black holes from the center of galaxies. And gravitational waves, as we spoke about before, tells a lot, a lot about the space-time, the structure, the, how the black holes themselves are made, but how they are orbiting, etc. Now, the gas, the, there is ga if there is gas um, out there, they, it would emit light, and if we can emit the light, the photons emitted by the gas, then we can learn a lot about the environment. Mm. Um, so, what kind of environment is are you know close to these merging black holes? And so, from there, we can learn a lot about how uh, you know galaxies, um, you know centers of galaxies are formed, and you know. Uh, so, with, with 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 so many, you know, in the environment, so many kind of black holes. Uh, what are the dream observation from your perspective? that you well, want to see, you know, within the next few years. More black okay. holes. More black holes. More black holes. <laughs> <laughs> and I think um, more black holes, but with, uh, with gas and as well as, you know, um, I would like to see really, um, you know, lights in, and understanding also, you know, bl supermassive black holes also are seen to emit very powerful jets, right? So I would like to, to understand, you know, the origins of these jets and, you know, how how they become so powerful. And this is only, you know, uh, seen around these very large supermassive black holes, these very powerful jets that extend kiloparsec away from the origin. So they're extremely powerful. They're very strong magnetic fields uh, there. So there's nothing more powerful than a black hole. And imagine a supermassive black hole encountering another one. So, so this is really the start of a completely new era in astrophysics. That is correct, yeah.